Well, praise God. <clears throat> you have your Bible, Psalms 104. 104. Remember the last couple of times we were together, praise God. We were talking about, if you remember the subject, fire, light, and glory. In that order. Amen. Sound good, doesn't it? <laughs> fire, light, and glory. I believe, praise God, with all of my heart, and I believe this, that the Lord wants to bring, and we pointed this out to you before, a baptism of fire to the church. And it's important that we understand this because it's something that you must seek. Amen. I want to emphasize that. It's something you must seek. Amen? There's always precedent in scriptures. Those in Acts 2, 4 went and sought it out. And they experienced it before the rest of the church did. Amen? So it's something that you must seek. And it's something that you can experience, praise God, before the rest of the body of Christ. There's always a blessing is in being first, you know? Amen? You know as well as I do, there are so many problems in the church, and only a baptism of fire will clean it up. You say, well, how do you know the church is so messed up? How do you know the church has so many problems? Look at our world. Better yet, look at our nation. Amen? The church will, the nation will not be where it is if it was not for the condition of the church. And the Lord admonishment was not to the world, it was to the church, if my people. Amen. The world's not going to listen to him. Unfortunately, most of the church is not listening to him. Most of the church is yielding to the flesh and how they feel. Amen. Instead of what Holy Spirit, amen, wants them to feel. So Adam had a literal walk with God. Now we can go beyond that. A literal walk in the garden. The Bible says he walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. That, that speaks of relationship. So there was a God, does he, though he does not live in time, God honors time, when you make, especially when you make that time for him. Amen. And I can guarantee you it was the exact same time that God walked with Adam every day. Amen. So he had a, he had a relationship with the Lord. And in that relationship, before the woman came, in that relationship and all that walking, from that place, he named all of the animals. They marched before him one by one. God spoke to him the reason he made them. And from that reasoning came the name. Amen. It should be the same way with your children. The reason God gave them. And from that reasoning should come the name. Amen. <clears throat> so, a relationship with the Lord where the spirit world was totally open to him. And he related to God on a spiritual plane, not a natural plane. Amen. Even though, remember, Adam was not a mortal, a, a mortal man. He was a he was an eternal man, just like the second Adam was, Jesus. Adam never would have known death if he had not disobeyed. Jesus never would have experienced death. His body would have stopped at the age of 30-some and begin to regenerate and never age. That was God's intention. Amen. And just how you look, if you can remember back there for all of you that are old, just how you look when you were 33, that's how you will look throughout eternity. 
of course, more glorified. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. No makeup, no toning cream. Amen. The glory shall be your cream and everything else you need. Praise God. So both Adam and Eve knew the voice of God as their spiritual senses were very acute, refined. They could relate to the spirit realm as easily as you relate to the natural realm now. There was no veil. Amen. There was no veil. Now, it's not like you see, but you can, but it's not like you see them both all the time consistently because you'll be distracted from this world. At your will, the, you see. You see what's in this realm. And then at your will, this realm can disappear and you can see what's behind that veil. Amen. This is how Adam walked. And this is what God wants to bring us back to. Amen. You should have that in mind. So the Bible tells us in Psalms 104 verse 2. That God was clothed in light. So Adam and Eve, he made in his image, were clothed in light also, right? Light was their clothes. Just like every animal, they're clothed from inside out. Amen. It's so, so it was with Adam and Eve. They radiated an incredible light. So they were made in the image and likeness of God. However, we know that through sin, they lost their clothing. Amen? We know because we have the word of God that tells us. They lost their clothing. The Bible says that after the fall, they knew they were naked. Didn't say anything about it before then. Why? Because of the degree of light. You couldn't see past the light, y'all. Amen. <laughs> and so they lost that. And it signified also a loss of what? Relationship. A walk that they had. So Adam and Eve had become earthly, sensual. And this shut them out from that higher realm of God's world. So now... Now, think about this. Now they got to relate to God differently. Amen. They related to God from their soul, but from a soul that was not fallen. Amen. He named the angels from his soul because it was not fallen. He used an aspect of his brain. All of it. Amen. The neural link between his brain and his soul was not interrupted. All cylinders of his brain was firing. So after the fall, that shut down. Amen. And all of us was relegated to a small aspect of our brain. It usually, because of the grace of God, some come out of their mother's womb with a little more activated. Hence their higher IQ. But that's the exception. That's not the norm. Amen? God does that what? Because of his goodness and his love for fallen humanity. To bring you what? To bring us some of the things that we should have had had not we fall. You understand what I'm saying? From an intellectual perspective. Hallelujah. But we see throughout Scripture what God can do even with a fallen man. For instance, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His companion, Daniel. The Bible said God gave them wisdom and knowledge beyond all that were like unto them. And they were their young teenagers. Now, brother, sister, that was under the law. What can you acquire under the new covenant? With the blood of Jesus. Amen. Listen. These things you should be pressing into. 
These things you should be believing for. The scripture said Jesus was made unto us what? Right, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Wisdom. Psalm tells us, Proverbs tells us, and all that you're getting, wisdom is the key principal thing. Well, he's been made unto you that. And it comes through into us by revelation. Now listen, this is, the, this is the most wonderful thing about the Word of God. You can read the Scriptures as you do every day. Just beyond meditation. You can read the Scriptures, and from the Scriptures inside of you, it will release wisdom. Amen. Now, just to know certain things, let me talk to you from a pastoral perspective. When people come to me, you know, and not so much necessary counseling, especially if you've submitted yourself to this ministry, just, just asking a question, not just about spiritual things, even natural things. Certain things I just know. Wisdom will come, and I just know this is the best way to do that. I don't have to think about it real hard. It just comes into my mind. See, now that's from a gifting, amen, a pastoral calling. Well, that should be normal for you. I said that should be normal for you. Because, amen, that's what has been given to you, this life. The life of God that's on the inside of you. That's one of the things it's for. To teach you, amen, how to live in this life. How to prosper in this life. From what? A godly perspective. Because there are people that's living in this life every day. But not from a godly perspective. They're not prospering from a godly perspective. Right? So in Genesis chapter 3 verse 24. So he, God, drove out the man. And he placed him in the, he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubims. Cherubims. Remember the four-faced creatures. And not just the cherubim, but a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life or to keep anyone from approaching the tree of life. Notice how God does certain things. He could have just plucked it up from the root, right? But he blocked it. Why? Because life was given to man. Life was given to man. So God blocked it. When he blocked it, the veil went up. The veil went up, amen, that divided this word from that one. A veil went up inside of man a dark veil that divided his psyche, amen, from the spirit realm. So, and so this was, this, this, this is what this represented. So, now, they had a much lower level of communication and relationship, okay? In the spirit world, communication is telepathy, mental telepathy. There's no speaking. You can, but there isn't. Thoughts are past. Thoughts move faster than light. Thoughts has a wider, much wider range of expression. In the spirit world, especially in heaven, everyone knows your thoughts. Well, everybody knows your name. It's not in a bar, it's in heaven. You walk down heaven. Oh, hey, so-and-so, you never introduce yourself. They know who you are. Amen. There's a certain level of revelation that's revealed by Holy Spirit. It is not hidden. I say it is not hidden. In the same way, in this world, in this world, the devil don't have to read your mind. He can see your thoughts. Amen. Because what you consistently meditate on, amen, comes out of you. Comes out of you like electrical waves. Huh? 
How many of you seen the movie um, Lucy? Well, then you see in there, and see all all the all the, the, the these things that these people get in these movies is because of what they perceive from from the enemy. So, did you see how she could see the broadband, the lights together, the broadband? You know, and she was reading the broadband, right? That's that's what's re- released from you, and it's read spiritually, just like we have natural equipment that could read Wi-Fi, right? It's floating through the sky. It's floating all around you, right? And they're talking about 5G and how how deadly it is and how program programmable it is, but that's a totally different message. Don't want to get off in there. But there is levels of dangers in there. Only because of what they are creating to connect to it. You know, there are two sides to a magnet. Right? You get 5G. But if I can cock something that you have to take every day, like a shot or something, then it starts interacting with that, then it can create something negative in your body. This is what they're doing. Huh? Right? You know, Elon Musk, he's working on a device that can create a neural link to your brain. A neural link to your brain. Can you believe that? And with that neural link to your brain, he's trying to do, undo what God did. Do you to access all of your brain. Upon accessing all of your brain, then what happens? Now you can do what spirit communication, what they do in heaven, telepathy. You don't have to talk. He's working on that now. <laughs> huh? Stuff that they're doing that they wouldn't dare tell you, scientists. For what purpose? Not to enhance you. Everything is moving to the mark. Well, the Antichrist, who is not everywhere, can track you, know your thoughts. And know where you are. Huh? If he, in a sense, make you a Wi-Fi signal, because that's what the mark does. It changes your DNA and make you readable through the airwaves. Right? Yes, it does. Whether you believe it or not. You walk up. See, everything is a step toward that. Apple Pay, Google Pay. You take your phone. Well, one day that mark in your phone is going to be in your forehead or in your hand. Amen. You hear me? American Express called me the other day. Now, here's a number that I hardly ever use. The only place I use it online is rep- rep- reputable companies like AT&T, where I pay a recurring bill, right? They call me and says, Mr. Underwood, we got a fraud alert. Now, it had not made it on my present bill yet that was mailed to me. And so... Then they send it, then I, I, this is after I missed their call, then they sent me an email. So I'm looking in the email that they sent me, and here's two charges on there. One for some Chinese currency, 6000 and something dollars. So he says, Mr. Underwood, now, of course, they didn't pay it. it says, he says, did you make that charge? I said, he said, did you or your wife make that charge? I said, no. He said, well, this one from Walmart. I said, is that Utah under there? I said, I ain't never been to Utah. <laughs> he said, yeah. Then my next question was, how these people get my number? He said, Mr. Underwood, he says, 
these hackers are getting very, very, very good. Well, ask yourself a question. Now, this is what. Can't prove it. But this is what I think. Here are company, American companies, are shipping all of their service departments, everything overseas. That is the only way somebody arbitrarily just took my number. There was no other way that they could have got it. No other way. But what can you do? My point is this. Everything is moving. Everything is moving toward this central government, this one world government. Amen. And so you have to know, amen, what God expects of you, what God's plan is, and how that in plan involves you. Amen. Because there are certain things that you can do in the natural, well, especially in this place of the mark, there are, no, there are points of no return. We are slowly moving to periods of time in church history where there are points of no return. You cross a line. When Judah kissed the Lord at the table and then got up and left, he crossed the line of no return then. Prior to that, he had time. Do you, do you hear me? Listen, I'm saying something very, very, very important. Many in the church, they are coming to a point. Now, this line consists of different things. When you cross a particular line, there is, a no, there is a place of, of no return in retrospect to salvation, okay, just as Judas. But there's also a place of no return, amen, in retrospect in certain things happening in you spiritually that God wants that should be happening to the church as a whole. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's not, when it comes to bridal ship, it's not that one is up here, one is down there, one is down there, one is up here when it comes to bridal ship. Now, that was the case because we all, all have our own individual growths, right? And growth levels. But there was a point in time where everybody hit the same point. I'm talking about those that are preparing themselves. They hit a certain point all at the same time. And the Lord right now is doing what? Bringing everyone from that level at the same time, up at the same time. That's the remnant. Huh? That's, 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 that's a better way, word of saying it. There was a point where many in the church hit the remnant mark. And now they are progressing at the same level. Amen. Amen. So you have all of those who have not are all at different spiritual levels. And many of them are going to hit a certain point. Now, because of the mercy of God, the mercy of God, you know what he's going to do? He's going to turn many of them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I'm talking about Christians. Why? So that their spirit can be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Because if they reach that mark of perdition of no return, the sentence of hell is upon them, such as Judas. Amen. So here, this is where we are. All of this is happening right now in the timeline that we're in, brother, sister. So you want to stay focused. Do you know what I'm saying to you? You want to stay focused. First Corinthians 2 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are what? Spiritually discerned. 
So the Bible says that the natural man is an enemy of the rim of God. See, what you think don't mean squat. You got to know from a spiritual perspective. Hallelujah. So we understand that by the cherubims that stood at the gate of the garden and the flaming swore that paradise regained would only be through what? Fire. Remember, it was a flaming swore, remember? Paradise regained would only be through fire. So, the scripture is saying you have to pass through the fire to get to the tree of life. Right? This is what the cross is all about, y'all. We have to get past the flame and sword if we are going to come back. So, God began to show us through his word and through history of the Old Testament the way back into the realm where Adam and Eve first walked. Hence, the law, all right, and the ceremony aspects of the law. God first began to initiate a series of offerings, right, which were to be made by fire. And these were pictures of the way back into the presence of God. That's why God started teaching the Old Testament church. So in Leviticus chapter 1 and 8, Moses had been dealing with Moses had been dealing with the offerings, the altars, the sacrifices, the fire. And then in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 6, Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord had commanded that ye should do, and the glory of the Lord shall appear to you. Now, it was all in retrospect to the offerings, right? You do this, the glory of the Lord will appear, right? So all these chapters are about offerings which were made by fire. These five offerings represented the laying down or surrendering of your life. That's what they represent. Now, fire is always related to altars in Scripture. Always. Altars are always related to what? Sacrifice and death. Right. So we have the picture in the Old Testament when God first called his people out. Of the offerings, the burnt offering. The meat offering or meal offering, the peace offering, the sin offering and the other one, the trespass offering. All were made or to be made by fire. And he said, if they would do this. Right? Each offering, the glory of the Lord would appear. Right? So, our God is a consuming fire. Where there is light from a spiritual perspective, there is fire. Right? Though in the natural realm, fire is not to make, to make light, though it does. Right? It's a byproduct of it. Right? If you were to appear before God himself, in the very center of him, this absolute pure energy. Huh? I mean, what you cannot believe. The closest thing that we can come to understand it is look at our son, S U N. You know, it's consistency, it's fire, all of that that is involved in it. This represents our Father. It is a natural manifestation of a spiritual God. Huh? Consuming. Consuming. We have solar flares sometimes that hits the earth that are very destructive and damaging to the earth. So we cannot begin to imagine our God. There is no comprehension of him through seeing or intellectually. You cannot. You cannot. So God does what? He manifests himself or pours himself into things, what I like to say, to reveal himself or an aspect of himself. Amen? So there's so much about our Father. 
that we do not know. We have not yet to comprehend, but we will know when we are joined to what? Our king. <laughs> Hallelujah. Brother, sister, can you wait? Can't wait. Hallelujah. So it is important to understand this. So basically, these offerings represent all of us laying down our lives in absolute surrender to the Lord. That's what they represented under the Old Testament. They could not connect with God spiritually. So God gave them something naturally to connect with, uh, and that connected them to God on a spiritual level in obedience. It was something they must be willing to do, right? Now, believe it or not, there are certain things that you are doing every day that connects you in the same way. Without the animals, without the burning of, you know, make building an altar in your house, all of that stuff. But the same thing is happening spiritually on a much, much higher level. So someone asked, you know, doctor, you ever, you've heard of D Dwight L. Moody. Been in the ministry for years and years and years and years. At the very end of his life, what was the most important thing? And he answered very simply, absolute surrender. Do you hear me? Now, before when we taught a lesson in retrospect to surrendering, in order to surrender, you have to do what? Yield. We established you very clearly the church has a yielding problem. Well, you won't yield unless you surrender. Right? So, if you come to the place of absolute surrender, the glory of God is going to appear. That's the picture that's being painted. All right? You're with me. Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Here's what Paul tells you to do. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, is nothing beyond what you should do. Right? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Paul was saying here to us to take our life, Make it an offering unto the Lord. That's what he's saying. So God requires absolute surrender unto him. Then the fire would come and transform us. And we'll begin to know God. See, you can only know God through sanctification. The more layers of darkness are washed away from you, the more you can see and comprehend God on that level right so the carnality the lack of yieldedness the lack of taking up our cross it only speaks to what in the church the lack of purity right if you got a lack of purity let's get down to the core a lack of love right all right so God requires absolute surrender unto him. Then the fire will come and transform us. So Paul was picking up here the sacrifices in Leviticus from the Old Testament. That's what he's making the, 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 the comparison with. So this meant that we are to die to ourselves, die to our ambitions, die to everything that we want until there is nothing left of us. Now, this is not taught in church. We read the scriptures, but there is too much your personality involved with the things of God. This is about dying. Only where you die can Jesus manifest, be formed, right? So, this concept then is the way of the flaming sword. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. 
Genesis 3, verse 24. Everything God does speaks a lesson to us. Everything. So there are a number of very interesting purposes for fire in the Bible. You study Malachi 3, 2, 3, and 4. The context of the book of Malachi is the end time church, okay? And in these three verses, the context is gold and silver. And after this refining, another kind of offering may be made unto the Lord after this refining. So there is very little pure gold in the world. We know that, right? Very little pure gold. Absolute pure gold is so soft, there's almost no practicality to it. Absolute pure gold. So when gold is heated up, and Peter talks about this, so does Paul. When gold is heated up till all the junk comes to the top, right? And when God baptizes us in fire, what happens? All the junk comes to the top. The dross, or what we talked about last time, chaff. Right? So when the junk and gold comes to the top, it's skimmed off. You ever seen blacksmith? You see them in there skimming the stuff off the top. So it's heated up again. And so on. Till there's no more draws surfacing. And the person heating it, now watch this, can look down and see a perfect reflection that's why the gold in heaven you can see clean through the streets it's signifying purity the level of purity in heaven there is no shadows in heaven why because shadow speaks of deficiency amen darkness there's no shadow of turning in God he's absolute light right so, so this is the background. And God says he's going to purify you as gold. All right? So this is what fire is all about. This is what you've been called to. Many would not give themselves to this experience. That's why there's only a remnant, brother, sister. It is painful, both naturally and spiritually. For God's fire to move inside of you and for the fiery trials of temptation to come against you. What is happening? What is being determined, probably is a better way of saying it, which fire you will succumb to. The fires of temptation or the fires of the presence of God on the inside of you. If you resist temptation, then you release more of the fire of God inside of you. It will move forth freely. That's why it stops in so many people. That's why there's very little purity, no perfection, no growth spiritually, because they keep yielding to the fires of temptation. Listen, both can shape you. One shapes you unto light, the other shapes you unto darkness. You hear me? You have to understand that. So, how many of you know that the church needs to be an exact replica of the king? That's what the Lord is after, but it is only through fire. So, God is working and has a plan and purpose. So he's talking about sitting in Malachi. That's what he's talking about. Sitting as a refiner. <laughs> or oh, let me tell you this, a furnace. He is both the man who's doing the scooping and he's the furnace too. <laughs> so he sit in Malachi as a refiner in Malachi 3, a purifier of the sons of Levi. 
And then the verse talks about purging fire. To refine, to make pure, to remove the mixture. See, in all of us, there's mixture. In the most holiest saint of God on the earth, there is mixture. Amen. So the whole concept of purity in the New Testament is to be what? Unmixed. You can have gold and silver together, but that's not pure. When the Bible talks about purity, it means being separated from everything else. So, the Old Testament closes out in Malachi, Malachi, speaking to the New Testament church, the last voice of the prophets for 420 years before Jesus comes on the scene. So it closes out with the picture of the Lord coming to the end time church, that's us. And he's going to sit as a refiner's fire. Now when he comes into the New Testament, into the New Testament, in Matthews, Matthew chapter 3, 11. He says, I indeed, John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He, the refiner, shall baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Bless our dear hearts. We got Holy Ghost, got a little tongue, and thought we were something. Amen. But very little fire touches us. So, He's now talking about the Lord, who is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit, but also with fire. For the last 50 years, we have had a baptism with Holy Spirit with no fire in the church the last 50 years. The last time we saw a real level of fire, a real level of fire in America that it produced so many different denominations was in 1906. Meaningful fire that affected all of America. Amen? England experienced the same thing. Jonathan Edwards in England prior to 1906. So the church is due for some fire, y'all. <laughs> so now there is an era, and Malachi brings it out, where he wants, he being Jesus, wants to bring fire into the church, so he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Matthew 3.12. Whose fan is in his hands, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. His floor. That's the place you stand before him, the church as a whole, and the place he stands in you. You're his floor also. Okay? So, looking at the language of this, there is one coming who will baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Now the Bible says there came tongues of fire that sat upon them and the people in the upper room were never the same before. Now get, get this picture. Time period. Remember I told you there's time periods in God that are set, pre-established by God. Okay. Many times, God moves the time period. Why? Because the people, there are not enough people that are ready. That's the mercy of God. But there is a time period that has been set, y'all, in God where fire will hit those who have reached a certain level. 
And that's the only place that fire will go. It will not go down below that. It will not reach outside of that. Only those who have reached that level, this fire will touch. It's already been set in God. The time period has been set. And it is not far off. I'm telling you, it is not far off. So the Bible says concerning those in Acts 2, 4, they were in their upper room. They were never the same again. Here they were. Jesus had been crucified. Christians and everybody that had been associated with Jesus was now on the hit list. They were on the hit list. They were all 120 in the upper room. Remember, there was supposed to have been 500. Only 120 thought enough to go. Scared to death, basically. Hiding and suddenly, without warning, suddenly they hear, they hear this roar being made by Holy Ghost. And they baptize with fire. Then Peter goes straight out in an open air meeting in the street, preaches a sermon in one minute, and 3,000 get saved. Now, Peter couldn't have did that before. He kind of, now, all that Jesus had said to them that they did not understand when the fire came and burned away the draft, it all came together for them. They saw clearly. An anointing and power came upon them. Well, their words were so mighty, it drove out darkness in people, and they were saved. Amen. Now, we see Jesus walking in the same thing. The scripture says about him, his words were weighty and with power. That's what fire does. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, you know, different pastors have had experience of trying to get their people to go out and witness in the streets. How many of you know that won't work? I tried it the first time I passed. Told classes on evangelism. Did it all. Amen. <laughs> Accomplished nothing. It's really hard, and a few will. A few will. That's why an evangelist having a burning within him, that fire of evangelism burns in the evangelist all the time. Why would you think, now stop and think about it, five giftings were given to perfect the church. If the church is saved, why would you need an evangelist? He goes to the world, right? Why would you need an evangelist? Because the evangelist comes in with the fire that is in them and he preaches and he, he releases that fire for souls on the saved. See, that's one of, the, one of the main reasons for the evangelist in retrospect to the church. Hallelujah. So, right after this upper room experience, they could not be stopped. They were totally revolutionized. So God began to move in them in incredible ways. Now, the analogy, okay, in verse 12 is to get rid of the chaff. That's what I want to get back to. To get rid of the chaff. It was that little outside area that covers the, the chaff is, that covers the wheat, the barley seed. It was the covering. So the seed had to be separated from the chaff, right? See, many of you have things planted inside of you that your soul have not allowed to be released, though you know it, right? You even desire it. I'm talking about from a revelation standpoint. The seed is dropped inside of you. You know it. You know it from a revelatory standpoint. But you have not experienced it. Why? The, the atmosphere is not conducive to the separating of the seed from the chaff. This is why you need to fire. When God's fire falls in you, seeds that have been planted on the inside of you, 
that have been dormant on the inside of you will burn away the chaff and true sink inside of you and turn to life. Roots and fruitfulness almost overnight. That's what happened to Peter and the disciples. See, Jesus planted seeds in them for three years. Huh? And then he turned around and said, how long would I be with you? Y'all ain't getting it. Now, that's Eugene's translation, but that's what he was saying. But he understood the process. Until the fire came and separate the chaff out of the seed and it sprouted and water hit it. Huh? Right? Remember, rain comes out to the fire. All of this happened right in the, in the, in the, in the, in the upper room. Fire, rain, boom, boom, an explosion. They come out of there. This is what you have to look forward to, y'all. You hear me? This is what you have to look for. See, you can't do this. So you just simply have to hold the line, maintain, amen, an area, an element of sanctification in your life until this time period comes. And I'm telling you, it's almost upon you. I'm telling you. But right now, most Christians are covered with chaff. This is what I'm saying. Because the fire hasn't been there. And all the rubbish, the chaff covers our spirit. It can be hurts, fears, inferiorities, tradition, hereditary problems, sexual chaff, abuse, huh? chaff in the mind, such as wrong concept, bad memories. All this chaff covers a person. Someone get baptized in the Holy Spirit, but the chaff is still there. It's still there. It covers the person's spirit. It locks them out of the real world, of the spirit, what Jesus is and where his life flows. Now, we see that all the time, even with saved people, right? We see it. We want so much for them to be free. We pray for them. We do everything that we possibly can, but it seems like they can't break free. What's needed? Fire. Fire. So people get born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, but the chaff locks them out of what Adam had. Because all the hurts, fears, background, consequences of sin in a person's life remain as chaff. Then on top of all of that, you know, the hereditary sins comes in and drops itself. That's what's in your DNA. Your DNA. That's what makes you who you are. Wait till God starts burning that. <laughs> huh? I'm telling you. Totally separate you from your genealogy and all his curses. God comes along. Yes, he forgives our sins. He cleanses us with the blood. But the consequences of sin remains until the fire goes through us. See, this chaff is the problem that locks us out from the walk with God in the realm of the spirit. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12 and 29, look at it. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, he's not, say, he's not saying that. Why is that in there? He's not saying that to scare us. That should greatly cause joy to come to your heart. When you understand the fire of his purpose concerning you. He's a consuming fire. The baptism of fire has to come. Look at what it did to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah was a good man, but the Bible says he was polluted by the contamination of his day. And he didn't even realize it. He didn't even realize it, like most of the church. Until what? He was in presence of the Lord. That's why worship, brother, sister, and prayer is so good because it brings you into the presence of the Lord and you can't see yourself until you do. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
You can come right into church, amen, and sit there. You can hear levels of the word of God through conviction. That's good. But there is an aspect of you as a Christian, if you never touch it yourself, you will never experience it. And that's times of worship and prayer, amen. And that's why it's so important. I dare say the worship is the most important part of the service, of any service, church service. Amen. Because the worship helps do what? Washes away filth. It gets you ready for what? The deposit of the seed, the word. Amen. So here is I poor Isaiah. He says, then I said, Woe is me. Okay, but he only said it when he saw Jesus. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, when you see Jesus, you see an aspect of him only what he wants you to see. And when you see him, it reveals an aspect of yourself. God is getting, read, getting Isaiah ready to go into a real prophetic ministry. This is what was happening. But he had to be touched by fire. Otherwise, what Isaiah spoke was going to be what? Mixture. So God gets him into the presence of the Lord in verse 6. Then... One of the seraphims flew, got coals from the altar of God, brought it back, and touched his lips. And this is what he said in verse 7. <clears throat> and, he had, he, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sins purged. Now, listen, brother, sister, this is not just symbolic. God is literally showing to you what happens to the believer in the New Testament. Now, listen, let me tell you. I don't know when. I do not know when. I know how and I know where. But I do not know when. One of these seraphims will one day fly into this building. It is the plan of God for one of them to fly into every church. That's God's heart. One of these things, when it does, <coughs> it will totally transform you when it does people will come not just here wherever this being is will come and many of them will lay for days in this thing's presence for days why because the normal thing is to be is to be sanctified every day you understand what I'm saying? This is what we as humans, this is what you don't understand. S Jesus told us in the parable, certain things just can't not be ripped out of you. It cannot. You take the bad with the good. Huh? Now, there is a concept in the 16th century that was started. And, but... And it brought a false doctrine into the church back then. That what everybody that went into hell, that is burned, burned, they would eventually be purified to a level and then let out. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Doesn't teach that at all. His, this, is, this is natural fires ignited by the Spirit of God that never dies, that consumes flesh, consumes flesh, huh? 
Don't consume the bones and don't consume the worms that is in the fire. But it consumes flesh throughout eternity. Okay? That's a destructive part of God that you never want to experience. That's a, that's a consuming part of God that you never want to experience his judgment. But there is a loving, purifying part of God that we are talking about where he comes and his fire slowly lay, layers just like the blacksmith that has the gold and slowly pulls away the shafts and it purifies and purifies. This is what's going to happen when the seraphim flies in. And for days, some, it's going to take days for some things so entrenched, so deep. huh? But this is the key thing. It will never happen. If they had not yield. You know what I'm saying? Within yourself. And I keep saying this. I, I want you to understand this. Within yourself. Is this longing for purity. For sanctification. For rightness. For doing right. You must keep. Fanning that. If that ever dies and you're as a Christian, you're done for. You hear me? You're doomed. Because your willingness goes with that. Goes. Your humility goes with that. Your yieldedness goes with that. So you must keep that burning. What? Until he comes. See, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how, how successful you are in accomplishing it yourself. Because we already know we can't do it ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? Some of us has things in us that we cannot rid from ourselves. That's just a fact. You can be good as you desire. But if the temptation is greater, your goodness goes out the window. And the only reason the temptation has not been greater is God has been keeping it from you. Because he knows you will fall and be destroyed. So there is nothing taking you such as common to man. God will not let you be judged above that which you are able. So God knows that. So if God never allows it, and then you never can be perfected. You never can be cleansed or purged. You never come to that level. That's the problem with that. So, your willingness, your desire for hunger and purity, you cannot let die. You cannot, regardless again, if you know your life stinks, you still cannot let it die. Because it is that that will attract the fire of God to you. It will attract it to you. And God will change you. You understand what I'm saying? That's why he said, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Amen. But see, that is gone in much of the church. It's not there. They are, sat they are satisfied with religion. They're satisfied with religion. They're satisfied with coming to church, hearing a little message, and giving some money every now and then, and then that's it. That's not enough. Do you hear me? That is not enough. In this present darkness in the world, you will fall in one of those categories that I described to you earlier. He will turn you over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Yes. He will do that. I've known people he've done that too. Before you step over into perdition, or you end up like Judas. And walk away from the Lord and never return to him. When you walk away from the Lord at that level of revelation, you will go mad. That's what will happen. You will go mad. You will become suicidal. In this present of level of darkness that we are reaching now, there will be many that will lose their mind. You will see it. You will see it. This is why, brother and sister, it is important 
When you feel the hunger and thirst in you dying, you need to fast and pray until it returns. Do you hear me? Until it returns. And let that keep pulling you to the cross. Keep pulling you to the cross. It doesn't matter how many times you falter. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you make. It does not matter. As long as the willingness in you keeps there and stays strong and you keep crying out to God, he will include you in that burning. When, when the greatest teacher is in that burning, you hear what I'm saying? There were people in the upper room other than the 12 apostles who was with Jesus 24-7 every day. They were there, and there was ones that were there that, that just met him and just heard him. They all got the fire. Why? Because they obeyed. Stand to your feet. Come on, close your eyes for a moment. Lord, it is a promise you made to your church. There is a reason that the fire has been with hell for so long in the church. There are those here and there that have experienced it. You have let me experience it twice in my lifetime. Where this being came. And my flesh burned. But you have set a time and season for this to happen to the remnant. As they cross over, as they continue to move, cross over, they will, their foot will step into a level of time. And the fire will be poured out. As they pass through the fire and come out on the other side, they will come out a warrior bride ready to take on the evil of this world in the spirit realm that controls the minds of men. It is near. The season is upon them. I pray, Lord, I pray today that their faith fail not. This is my prayer for them today, Lord. Let their faith fail not. That they do not grow weary in doing well. Let them see. Let them know that they will reap, Lord, if they faint not. Let them know, Lord, by Spirit, Holy Spirit, that they're they're at the door. They're at the door. So I pray that their faith fail not. Come on, lift your hands toward heaven. Hallelujah. And within your heart, let that be your prayer to Holy Spirit, that your faith fail not. It's only by his grace. We told you how to keep it burning. We told you how to keep it alive. Let the willingness not die, Lord. Let the willingness in them to do right not die. Let them be willing to put the sacrifice upon the altar. What is required, yieldedness and obedience and the sacrifice brings your fire you would answer by fire once the fire falls lord 
once the fire falls and the chaff is removed, you will bring the rain and they will grow quickly, quickly. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Glory, glory. Come on, by faith. Let's thank him by faith. Let's count it done. Let's count it done. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. See it. See it. If you can see it, you can possess it. Hallelujah. See it by faith in your life. See it by faith operating, working in your life. By faith, he will lead you down the path. He will keep you away from the people that will be a distraction. See it by faith. He will keep you from the trials and tests to come. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. Your faithfulness to watch, watch over your word. Hallelujah. Just as you saw Isaiah. And you met him at his cry. Lord Jesus, I pray in these coming days that you will reveal an aspect of yourself so your people may see within them what they need to see that will create a cry within them as it did Isaiah to prepare them for the coming fire. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We honor you today, great Lord. Because no one loves us like you love us, Jesus. You proved it. You proved it. You proved it. History bear witness to it. I pray this for all of them, Lord, in the name of the King. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, isn't God good? Thank you.